Hey there, folks. Welcome to Leica Camera and to Mark and Camera's Artist Talk uh, with Mr. Phil Penman. So glad y'all are here. I see some uh, familiar names, familiar faces. Nice to see everyone. We're going to let uh, people start to join us for a minute or two here, and um, we'll make some introductions and we'll begin. Um, give, we'll give people a few minutes to uh, do that electronic, uh, electronic handshake, sign in, <laughs> going. Welcome, welcome everyone. Thank you very much for putting the events on. We really appreciate it. Hey, it's our pleasure. It's our pleasure. Very glad to do it. We're glad everyone's here. Hello, like a man. Hey, like a man. How are you? <laughs> hey, this is great. I'm excited for this. I'm glad that uh, y'all are here. Um, this is a uh, uh, this is the collaboration between um, like a camera and Tamarkin camera and Phil Penman, and who is uh, here to present. Uh, his wonderful photographs to us. You can see Phil waving at you. He is uh, in this big, all these squares, he is immediately um, uh, to my right, stage left, I guess it would be, to my How's right. How's everyone doing? Good? I, yeah, I, yeah, absolutely. Good. I see, I see a few names I recognize there. <laughs> good, good. The more the merrier. Yeah, good, good to see everyone. So Hi, good evening. <clears throat> Good evening. So we're, we've still got a few people coming in. Um, and, uh, and we'll wait just a moment or two more and then begin. Um, I, I wish on Zoom that I could see all of your faces all at once, but they would be so tiny on my screen that it wouldn't, it wouldn't work out so well. Uh, but suffice it to say that I'm scrolling across all of our attendees and I'm very glad to see your smiling faces and glad that uh, y'all are here. Um, so this artist talk with Phil Penman is a collaboration between Leica Camera and Tamarkin Camera and Phil and myself and John Kreidler, um, who is on the Zoom meeting and coordinating for us um, questions and facilitating the actual Zoom meeting. So thank you, John, very much and thank Leica Camera uh, for really um, putting this all together. Um, uh, we're just, we're, we're thrilled. Um, and so actually, since we're talking about Leica Camera, let me, let me introduce John. You may or may not know John Kreidler is the East Coast Product Specialist um, with Leica Camera here in the USA. Is Leica's streaming tech talk uh, uh, co-host on YouTube. And if you haven't checked out uh, the tech talk, Leica's tech talk on, on YouTube, please do that. Um, more than 25 years of experience, um, John can be found uh, during Pro Discovery Days, Leica Store events, Academy workshops throughout the country, and uh, check him out on Instagram at at Leica Pro Image. Um, uh, you can find him, uh, uh, his work was selected to appear in the new book, Inspiration Leica Academy. So if you don't get enough from his Instagram handle of his fine work, check that out. Um, he has an ongoing obsession with capturing light and shadow that began from a, an early age, and you can see that passion in his, uh, in his photography. So, so definitely check out John Kreidler and his work. Uh, again, Instagram handle is at like a pro image. Um, I'll introduce myself very quickly. I'm Dan Tamarkin of Tamarkin Camera. Um, I can be found at tamarkin.com, Dan at tamarkin.com, and I'm happy to make any connections that aren't made necessarily here on this call, on this um, artist talk on Zoom. So do feel free to reach out to me and I can put uh, uh, people in touch with one another if you like, if any connections don't happen here. With that, let me begin this evening's festivities with Mr. Phil Penman. Phil, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Good to hey, see everyone's smiling faces. Yeah, it's our pleasure. For those of you who may not know already or have had a chance to check out Phil's work, please do so at philpenman.com uh, or at philpenman on Instagram. A UK, New York-based photographer 
Uh, Phil has documented uh, the rapid influx of New York City streets for, for more than 25 years. Many, many, many high profile clients, the New York uh, Review of Books, The Guardian, he's been around. Um, photographs, <laughs> uh, celebrated living legends like Jennifer Lopez, Bill Gates, um, historical moments uh, such as the aftermath of the September 11th terrorist attacks. Um, he has a very, very distinctive style. Um, has been named uh, one of the 52 most influential street photographers alongside legends like Cartier-Bresson and Sebastio Salgado. He has a couple of books happening. One, his debut book, Street, launched as the number one new release on Amazon for street photography and has been, uh, been a bestseller ever since. So if you get a chance, check out um, his website. In fact, I implore you to check out his website. There are many, many, many beautiful photographs. I wrote a couple little notes about his photography in um, the introduction and invitation uh, for this artist talk. And uh, there are a lot of photographs that remind me of Andre Cortez and, uh, and Cartier Bresson and, and also Brassais and, um, and, and Fan Ho and a lot of uh, terrific black and white and color photographers. Um, so here's, having made the introduction, now you know who <laughs> we are. Um, I wish that we could all uh, uh, speak and, and, and talk and ask questions as actively, but there's a lot of us on this Zoom. So we ask that you um, please go mute and use the chat function to ask questions. Um, our, um, our ace, John Kreidler, is going to um, is going to facilitate the questions that you ask um, for myself and Phil. Um, and so, let me see. Um, use chat for the questions. It, it 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 may be best to keep your video off. You can. Uh, it's up to you. It, it depends on when we go when Phil begins his presentation and how you decide to view things and if you find that it's distracting you can turn your video off but mute is is very helpful for us um anyway with that um we're gonna let phil start talking and feel free to use the chat to ask questions we're gonna try to get to everyone's but in the event that we don't again i'm dan at tamarkin.com and i can facilitate ongoing conversations for any of you that might want to jump up and use the restroom, this is going to be recorded. Um, please get back as quickly as you can so you don't miss any of the good stuff. Uh, but it's going to, it's, it is going to be recorded so it'll be available later. So once again, John, thank you so much for putting this all together. And Phil, thank you so much for being here, man. I'm just thrilled to have you. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Um... Yeah, good to see you all. Uh, Dan, you probably won't remember, but to everyone else, Tamarkin is pretty much where I got my start uh, in New York City when I was uh, basically, for those that don't know, I used to be a celebrity photographer in New York City. I was pretty, uh, pretty depressed doing it. And uh, Tamarkin was became my way out and my addiction. I, I think four or five cameras in and five lenses. I had an, I had a problem. Kind of uh, got me out of one mess, um, got me into street. So it was kind of my escape from uh, what I was doing with my day to day job. And the beauty, you know, so although I hated my job, the celebrity stuff, the, the good thing about it was it, I was out on the street all day, every day. I spent about 12 hours a day on a bike riding around, and it just put me in a position where I was able to see things that I wouldn't necessarily be able to see if I was just going out for a few hours. You know, it's, um, take this for example, I, I don't go around and burn taxis down just for reference, just for pictures, but um, I was on a stakeout uh, waiting for Madonna this particular day when a taxi pulled up and decided to blow up right in front of us. Thankfully, no one was killed or injured. Uh, everyone got out, but just happened to be, you know, if I wasn't doing that job, I wouldn't have gotten this picture or, you know, put myself out there in Central Park to get this. I, I found myself, you know, the, 
the kind of towards the end of my career with the celebrity stuff when I was dying out. Um, I found myself going out looking for moments like this more so than the celebrities. So my work just kind of changed. Um, although I hated it, I wouldn't get pictures like, again, spacemen walking down through Soho. You know, this is me uh, while I was trawling around looking for celebrities. This, it, it was so bad. I spent so much time in this neighborhood that Google thought I lived there. That's how bad it was. You know, you know you're being tracked, right? But um, things like that, or you'd be cycling along Lafayette Street and you'd, you'd look to the left and there would be a mariachi band playing down some little hole in the wall. Uh, my buddy Sean there on 42nd Street, just uh, out for money. And then, you know, you've got your uh, occasional statue of David that's going home to some lucky customer with a very big New York apartment by the looks of it. But it's, um, you know, it just it, it was great. It got me thinking another way. Um, in 2015, I decided to go complete cold turkey with uh, the celebrity thing. I, I quit. I quit the business altogether, and I knew that I needed to put more time into doing this, um, trying to push my career. I actually took a job working for a cycling company at the same time, like selling a uh, lycra. I, I was like the northeast sales manager for a, a cycling company, and I would go on these. My my pitch was I would I was selling these clothes to like people across you know teams all over the across the country, and I'd be on these celebrity shoots at the same time. I used to do a lot of celebrity portraiture when I wasn't doing the street, so I'd kind of be in someone's celeb's house, and then I'd be quickly running to the toilet, hammering out these email orders for the other job that I was doing at the same time. And the plan was to do this long enough. Um, that I could generate enough money from shooting street to be able to go and quit that. And that's exactly what happened. And now I go around and shoot people walking turkeys for a living um, and get paid for it. Um, believe it or not, you know, it's, you never know what's going to happen. So like that picture that I just showed you with the, the guy walking the turkey, that's now in the, big print as a, in the corporate offices of Blackstone. So you never know, these pictures, are, I, you just never know where it's gonna go. Um, this and one has been bought by a couple of collectors, for example. Phil, do you find, do you find, we have a question, do you find that these moments come, kind of come to you or that you maybe spend more time seeking out moments like this? I mean, how, how much is serendipity and how much are you maybe noticing that a photograph is about to happen? So are you really asking me, do I follow freaks around or do I have a gaggle of freaks following me around? That's, no. that's kind of the interpret. No, no well, um, but no, yeah. in, in all seriousness, I think it's just a case of, um, being in the right place at the right time. Yeah. You know, and, and you've got to be ready to get it. And, and spending a lot of time in places, I would imagine, as well. Um, yeah. I, I got used to it because of the stakeout stuff. Like, spending two weeks on trying to get one picture was just part of the job. I, I have found, though, because I did that for so long, I've now got no patience whatsoever. <laughs> Like people talk about like the whole fisherman street photography mentality. And yeah, I, I have zero patience now. I'm, I'm like 30 minutes max, I think, <laughs> waiting for that picture. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm searching out different things. Like this is a little bit more old New York uh, where I'm, you know, I, I have different types of street work that I'm trying to go for. So there's like the street, street portraits, there's those candid moments where you just, you know, how many times are you going to see a guy walking a turkey around? You know, it's right. just that that's its own thing. Then there's the portraits where you just happen to run into the interesting people 
And then there are these kind of shots where um, you pre-envision a picture that you want to get and you might revisit a scene a certain amount of times waiting for the right lighting yes. or, the right, or the right kind of weather. So, you know, this morning uh, we had a foggy day in New York. Um, in my mind, I'm thinking, right, I want to see the city. Um, I'd like to see the Statue of Liberty. So I, I jumped on the, the uh, Staten Island Ferry. I had this image in my mind of, you know, silhouettes looking out the window at this Statue of Liberty um in the fog kind of in the distance you know and these are the shots I, where I'm, I'm thinking about it so you oh. know this, this shot in the oculus on the left um as john painfully knows what goes into this because he's seen the me give my presentation on this but it's not that you walk into a room and you go oh that's it yeah that's the shot you know and you instantly get it it, it might be in there, it was probably an hour of walking around and picking up on different elements and then putting that element with another element and creating that shot. Such as, such as waiting for somebody to enter that staircase where you have them at the top there. Well, you know, this, this particular start, I kind of started over here in the distance, playing around with silhouettes walking in the shadows and then slowly you walk around and you might start shooting people walking into the shadows and then it's like every time you take a picture you're picking up on something new it's like well hang on a minute if i use this use these people for scale with this sh shadow here but i use this beautiful light kind of giving you um scale and location and yeah. then you add in another element like this and then you're using someone coming down the stairwell but it can't just be anyone it's got to be the right shape of person or even that arm movement you know there's got to be something else that grabs you but it's a combination of all those things that gets you to that point did you wait for very long for that person to appear with that particular with something with, that, was, with... that was one of the very last frames ah. i had a lot of fun shooting in that spot and i when i i got home i i'm going through the pictures and i'm just like everything was ordinary yeah it's just like yeah it's another it's another silhouette another shadow picture and then at the end you know when you you're looking at your screen and you're just kind of like that aha moment like yeah that's the one you just you look at it and you know it yeah yeah, yeah. And, and um you go someone else must have grabbed my camera at that moment and took a quick sneaky picture <laughs> of it. Now, are you shooting? Are you shooting primarily film or digital? Uh, it's it's all digital these days. Um, the the cameras I had, I from you guys were like I had a six point two, an R eight, an R nine. I used to shoot a lot of color transparency. Um, I started in the darkroom with film, okay. so like Tri X, T Max, uh, technical pan okay. film. You know, I developed all my own stuff, printed all my own stuff. So, um, but for client stuff, like these days, unless it's someone who has a lot of money for a big campaign, it's all digital because they, they don't have the time either. Um, so it, this stuff's all digital. Like, you know, these, these are pictures, like the stuff I'm showing you now, this is all stuff where you're pre-envisioning a shot again. So like, you know, this shot on the left here, again, it's like, right, it's foggy. I'm going to use that as my backdrop. I've got the lights in the background of 42nd Street, um, kind of like Times Square lighting it up. The shot I had in mind was people walking across the street. And again, it was one of those things where you look at the images on the screen. It's all it, it all looks very cliche. And like a, an important note, why you never delete your images on the back of the camera is because I get home and I have this shot where the, the window is framing it. And, you know, if I went out there for the rest of the week, I probably still, I couldn't get that same picture, you know? And it was just one of those fleek, fluke um, things, but where it kind of all comes together. But again, you've got to put yourself out there and be there at the right time to get it. You got to have your camera. You got to be ready. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But there is there that that's 
what I was pointing out when I mentioned serendipity earlier. Um, and it's a good, and it, with digital, I think it's terrific because you don't, you don't have to worry so much about exactly how much film you have in the role. Uh, storage is cheap. <laughs> you know, you just, just keep them. Like one of the things that fascinates me that I'm curious about when I look at each of your images and really without exception, each of your images, I want to see the rest of that contact sheet. You know, I'm super curious about, about what else you took and how you curate. And I mean, I don't know if we'll get to that. I'm just mentioning that I'm super curious about that when I look at your photographs. Um, I've got a couple of questions. So if you don't, if you don't mind, let me. Um, yeah, go, go for it. How, how are you doing much in these shots with, with regard to post-processing, knowing that you're shooting digitally? Like what's your, what do you do once you've got that terrific shot? Well, that's the point. You, you've got to get it in camera. You're not gonna you're not gonna save anything by editing it, so it's got to be in camera. So it's like meticulous when you're shooting it. You're looking around the edges of the frame. Do I need that in the shot? Don't I need it in the shot? Um, and then editing wise, very minimal. I look at it as kind of like the same principles as you would do in the darkroom. I me too. Yeah. I, yeah. I. One, I don't have the skill set. I don't have the patience to go into like the, the, you know, you could create this picture from scratch now, you know? Right. Um, right. You know, this is a classic example of like where this, this shot, everyone looks at this and they go, oh, he photoshopped it. And I'm like, well, I'll show you the raw image. It just, it's just, it was there when you got there. And it's just a matter of capturing it. Um, you know, for me, I, there's very little that has been done to this picture. And what I have found, you know, early days of like silver effects, right? Um, we all got very addicted to structure and all these tools. And then you look at it like a year later and you're like, what the hell was I doing? That doesn't even look like an image. And it's the stuff that you over-engineer and you over-edit it really doesn't hold up very well over time. It might look cool and great at the moment, but you come back to that image, trust me, in two years, three years, and you're going to do what I did and re-edit everything. I, and I have been there. I do the same thing, absolutely, and I'm finding that less is more. You know, someone once said to me, when you're framing an image, just recall, I think it was Arthur Meyerson who told me, just think of it like this. You're responsible for every inch of that frame. Yeah. So you look in your corners, you look in your background. I mean, you're responsible for every inch of it. Um, knowing that you shoot digital and how little you do in post, what's your walking around camera these days? Um, primarily the monochrome, unless I'm doing this kind of stuff. So if I'm shooting like the snow stuff, which is my, that's my kind of my go-to. If we could get snowstorms all the time, I'd be quite happy. Um, then I'm then I'm using the SL2 for this okay. stuff. Uh, and are, are you use, are you using a zoom lens or do you have a focal length that you work with almost exclusively? Uh, primary lenses tend to be all prime. So like a 35 Sumalux is probably my go to. Uh, I have a 75 Noctilux, which is my favorite lens. That's yeah. just ridiculous. Uh, and then I'll use, I have like a 105 to 280 R lens and I have, yeah, yeah I, everyone's going to think I'm nuts, but I had the, that 90 to 280 SL lens and I swapped it for an old R lens because I, I prefer the look of it. And I can also, um, with the adapters, I could put that R lens onto the SL and the M system. Right. So it's a little bit more versatile. So I, I can go out and I can get those kind of images that I like. So this probably, I don't know, the way I say it is street photography can be bloody lonely. Um, so for me, one of the other assets I like is shooting street portraiture. So it was one of the one of the main things why I love New York. Uh, came here in '94. It was like it was the place where you could be whoever you wanted to be. You know, you could wear 
you know, massive baggy pants and hooded sneakers and Timberlands and stuff and big North Face jackets. If I, if I wore that in Dorset, where I come from, they just think that you were some kind of freak. Over here, you can, what, you can wear whatever you want, wherever you want. You know, if you want to put a bush on your head, you can do that. You know, no one's going to think any, any weirder of you. So I just found that um, being able to do like the street portraiture stuff and getting engaged in conversations with people, um, you know, Mr. Fashionista on the right and, you know, the guy that's going to scare the shit out of you on the way home <laughs> on the left. You just, it's interesting to get everyone's take, everyone's, uh, their story. Um, sometimes, you know, i I'll chat with someone for a minute. Sometimes I might chat with them for an hour and a half. Yeah. You know, everyone's that was gonna be. Yeah, that was one of my questions for you was, was how much do you engage with, with, with your portraiture subjects or how, or how little? People have very wildly differing styles um, with regard to street photography in general, but also to, to portraiture and street portraiture. I, I just, I really enjoy the conversation. I think it is, again, it goes to my days being on the street, the celebrity stuff. Like we were always on a stakeout and there was always someone near you that was just sat there as well. Um, you know, I'll give you a quick example, like not long after this picture, um, sat outside Tea and Sympathy, which uh, a chip shop in West Village. There's another guy who sat there and he's, he's paying too much attention to something and I'm paying too much attention to something. And he's like, you're not here for the same guy, are you? And it turned out he was internal affairs for the police monitoring some corrupt cop. And I'm there monitoring some celebrity who lives next door. And it's just like, you just, you get into these weird conversations all the time. Um, so there's a thing I find with New Yorkers as well like people that are actually either from here or they've spent a long time here. Um, they do like to just get in conversation. Like, you know, you have a long chat with your coffee vendor guy. Um, you t it's one of these like big, small cities where you could, I can pretty much go around any part of New York and I know somebody like it could be a doorman of a hotel or a, a street guy. Um, you know, there's always somebody, you know, like the guy on the right, you know, I'd love to know why he decided to walk up Madison Avenue that particular day dressed up as the Joker. You know, it wasn't Halloween. And was he just standing there in the light? No, the, you... the idea behind this was I was trying to get a sneaky picture of this guy reading his paper in the light. And I'm, I'm hovering around trying to figure out how am I going to get this shot? Yeah. And I turn to the right and all of a sudden I see this guy walking up Madison Avenue dressed as the Joker. And I'm like, can I do a quick portrait? Um, there's your picture. Yeah. Yeah. Do you mind just standing over here in the dark shadow of what the other guy's in the light? Um, this was like a very quick, uh, quick shot. The guy on the left was kind of like, um, you know, do you want, uh, do you want me to move? I'm out, out of the shot or not. And then you got, you know, stuff like this. This is kind of people that I just find very interesting. You know, the guy on the, the guy on the right, I just thought um, he, he had great character. I just went up to him and sometimes they're very surprised that you are asking to take their picture. Yeah. They're not the people you would normally suspect, you know, that you would want a shot of. So they're kind of surprised when you want to do their picture. Yeah. Yeah. Now do you, do you typically get releases when you do street portraits? Like, do you, do you use artist releases in the, in this, in these environments that we're seeing your photographs in? Um, no, it's, I kind of kills the moment and I'm not planning to use, use them for commercial campaigns or anything. You know, it's one thing if you decide you want to use it for a commercial shoot, like to advertise something right um right. then yeah obviously you have to have a model release otherwise right. now, they're gonna sue you otherwise um, you're gonna get sued right exactly yeah but now, it also kills the mood yeah i agree i i feel the same way now do you ever do that thing where you pretend to fidget with your camera like you don't know what you're doing while while 
the oh yeah, my, my camera is always going wrong. <laughs> um, now I, we have a question, and I'm I, I'm curious as well because I I want to give you an example. I took a workshop one time with somebody who said, "Don't wear sunglasses when you shoot street photography." I have very very sensitive eyes, so I love wearing my sunglasses, and I'm used and I'm I shoot with them. Like I'm okay. I'm comfortable shooting with them with the rangefinder, but people can't see me. Right. And people, you know, and so that resonated with me. And I'm like a sunglass freak. Do you feel I always, you're, invin you're invisible when you wear them? I do kind of feel like I'm invisible when I wear them. <laughs> but and, and then, but in cer at certain times, I feel like I, even though I have access, I feel like a little bit of an imposter. And, and so one, we have a question that yeah. is, do you find that being working in New York, and shooting street photography in New York. Do you find that having uh, uh, an accent is helpful in engaging with people that maybe they recognize you're not from New York and they might be a little bit more receptive to your no, taking? I, the I think I think people are generally all right. Like where we, so the thing with the thing with street, most people are looking at it's it's not so much the camera, it's how you're acting, okay, and how you carry yourself. If you walk around like all aggressive and you're in a hurry and everything, people, you know, but if, if you relax, yeah. you smile. Um, like when you're doing sneaky pictures, it's like you're looking at everything but the person you're taking a picture of. Mm. You know, you're looking down the street, you're looking at everything but them. And the thing with street is you're never reacting to something. You've, you've, you have to be able to predict what's going to happen. It's like, all right, this is my scene. Um, I need this to happen with that and that at the same time. So the, the camera is an extension of you. You know, you're, you're seeing someone 100 feet down the road who's interesting. You're figuring out they're going to be good with the sign that's on the wall. If I raise my camera too soon, they're going to walk behind me. I have to predict where they're going to walk so I can pre-focus on the ground where they're going to be, right? So you're thinking about these things as it's happening. So you put your camera down. You've already got your focus point. Yep. Your, your exposure is where you want it to be. The camera goes down and it doesn't come back up until they hit the spot where you want them to be. But you're never like, oh, there, oh there's a shot. You, you were always looking peripheral view, what's coming up where. And you, it's like you, um, the more you do it, the quicker you become at piecing things together. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, I, I enjoy doing that stuff, but, you know, I, I'm still kind of doing my news work as well. So I'm, I'm kind of very fortunate with some of my clients, like the New York Review of Books, where I can, I can pitch projects. So like the pandemic, for example, um, I was out there every single day working working for the papers. Um, after 9-11, I, I kind of made a lot of mistakes about the kind of pictures that I was missing. So I, I have all the images from the day and then the pictures that I was doing after the fact, I was missing a lot of stuff. So I, you know, kind of like the, when I look back on it now, the, the things that stick in my mind about 9-11 were all the missing signs on the bus shelters, like everywhere you went. And huh. I wish I wish I'd shot things like that because those are the things huh. that I remember now very clear in my mind. So with COVID, um, you know, I probably each year, 2020, 21, 22, I was editing down to about 9,000 images. And it was all, always shooting everything and anything. Um, you know, we'd, we'd all be, you know, if you watch the news, everyone would think that, the streets of New York were, were completely empty. You know, it's, it wasn't really, that wasn't the case. You know, that wasn't the reality of what was actually going on. Um, so I'd go out and pick up on little things like, you know, the rats roaming the streets, um, you know, the lone guy on Madison Avenue. Different kind of elements to the way I was looking at, you know, I'm thinking book projects, what are the images going to stand out 20 years from now? You know, like the shot on the left was Fifth Avenue. I, I think I've stood there for like five minutes without a single car coming behind me. Wow. Um, 
you know, the shot on the right, you've got this woman in a bubble. She was kind of like they were doing a sneaky little music video shoot. A lot of people, believe it or not, were trying to take advantage of like the empty Times Square to do sure all kinds of stuff. Um, you know, moments like this to me, very powerful. Um, this is kind of where your your storytelling, you know, for me, we've got this tired guy on the on the Staten Island Ferry with Lady Liberty kind of watching over us. You know, this these are the, the ideas that I have in my head when I'm shooting them. Um, what do you think about since we're looking at the these COVID time photographs? Was was it or is it where is was or is wearing a mask an issue for street photography? And I, I think that this person is asking this question in a more general sense, not just in the beginning of the quarantine, um, but since I suppose. So, you know, it's, it's all part of it. But the thing is, so someone said to me very early on, it's like, well, I, I'm not going to shoot the mask because it's, you know, it's too predictable. It's too cliche. Um, and so, well, okay. So you're not going to document masks at all. Okay. For me, for the street stuff, it was, it was never really an issue because I would shoot the masks, but they weren't the telling pictures for me with COVID. The, 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 cut, the telling pictures to me are, it's weird. So we're all stupid apparently, right? We need a box around a set of chairs to tell us what six feet is because we're all apparently too stupid to know where we can sit and stand. So we have to have a, a white box around a set of chairs or we have a sign on the, you must stand here and you must stand here and you must stand here. So to me, these are the telling pictures of, you know, you must stand six feet, social distancing. You know, these are all things that you should be thinking of anyway. But it's the fact that it's like everywhere you went, um, it's, it's very in your face. So for me, I was shooting a lot of that stuff. Um, also, you, when you're working as a photographer, you, you've always got to go against the grain of what everybody else is doing. Okay, if you want to stand out as a photographer, yeah. you, you, everyone else is following the cause, right? They're pushing whatever agenda is popular at the moment. You've got to go the other way because otherwise you're just, do, you're just shooting. So for me, the, the two standout things that never got spoken about was the construction industry and the homelessness. Construction went absolutely insane. It was like every block you walked on were jackhammers and road construction. And no one even mentioned this or spoke about this. They were doing in May of 2020, they were painting lampposts on Madison Avenue. Okay. They were doing all the maintenance work. And like, really, is this the time? <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm photographing guys painting lampposts. So I'm thinking about which projects do I want to work on? And, and the one that like really stood out to me was the homelessness. Yeah. And it was the only story that was out there at the time was how people were annoyed that they were messing up the trains at night. Yeah. So it, it kind of infuriated me. And also, like I said, I have a platform where I can get my work out there, but it needed to be from a personal perspective. Yeah. So I got the idea from it from Styles here. And Styles is kind of a regular on Ninth Avenue. They call him like the mayor of Ninth Avenue. Sits basking in the sun. Very intimidating dude. Huge guy. Just sits there all day. I usually cross the road from him because he scares the crap out of me. But during COVID, I'd walk around because the only people that I would see on the street were the people that were homeless. Yeah. So this particular day, I walked past Styles, nodded to him, said good morning. And he said to me, how come you never take my picture? So I was like, all right, I'll do your portrait. And we got chatting. I talk to him a lot now. 
Um, but he get, he kind of gave me the idea for it. So I went out there with like the intention of telling the story. You know, this is John, originally from New Jersey, uh, ran a restaurant out there. He's been living homeless in the city since 2012. Um, Tilly, she was on 8th Avenue, just trying to get $12 to get a pair of shoes. Then you got Tommy here, who was, um, I saw Tommy, I was walking down Broadway and all this stuff was being thrown into the back of a sanitation truck. And you can see in the shot on the right, those are all the possessions that he was kind of quickly moving to save. So we got chatting and uh, I said to him, you know, I really, I'd love to do a picture of the back of your jacket, you know, the fuck everything. It was like, perfect. We get talking and he's like, where are you from? Cause he picked up on the English accent and I said, well, I'm originally I'm from Dorset, England. And he said, yeah, but whereabouts? And I said, well, Dorset. And he said, yeah, where in Dorset? And it turned out we, we came from about five miles apart from each other. What do you know? Yeah. And here he is on the street. So that's so was, funny. Now, yeah, did you, did you find any awkwardness? Like well, when I, we have a question about uh, another question about wearing a mask and, 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 and street photography. And it occurred to me that maybe this question has more to do with when when you're photographing people and you're wearing a mask, did that feel like an impediment or has it become so ordinary for us now, this mask wearing thing that it's not really much of an impediment anymore? Well, I think some people are not going to stop wearing masks for the rest of their lives now. Yeah. And then you've also got certain countries where this is very much the norm. So, you know, I, I was getting, someone was educating me about the, younger kids in china and i was always intrigued about it why they're all wearing the masks you figure out right, the pollution and everything and apparently it comes from the pop stars so like the chinese pop stars over there they couldn't go out in public and they would wear a mask to disguise themselves so all the kids started wearing masks as a fashion statement this is way before covid okay so there are certain places that are going to have that's just the norm for them. And yeah. I really hope that it does not become the norm for us because yeah. you want, you want to see smiles, right? Yeah. As far as from a photography point of view, yeah, it's, but it can be the same barrier as a camera. Oh, so that's see, fair enough. You know, say you're doing a portrait of someone. Um, when I'm doing a portrait of someone, I, I'm not looking behind the camera. Yeah. You know, you initially you'll bring your camera up, you'll get your focus but the camera comes down when you're taking the pictures and you're talking to them. I do the same the, thing. And shooting whilst you're talking to them. Yep. So, what do you, sorry. How do you handle, I'm sorry to interrupt. How do you handle the occasional awkward moments when a person thinks that you're about to photograph them and maybe doesn't like it that you took their photo or doesn't like it that you're about to take their photo? I won't do it. If it's going to make someone feel awkward. Yeah. You know, I, you've got to bear in mind, I did for 15 years where I was paid to take pictures of people that most of them did not want to have their picture taken. Yet they were in the industry of having, needing to have their picture taken. Otherwise they weren't relevant anymore. Right. Um, but you, we were constantly dealing with that. And I think because I was in that so much, I now I'm very aware of like, it's not that important to me. There's another picture yeah. down the street. I don't want to make ruin someone's day so that I can get some shot. That's re refreshing. It's that's re refreshing kindness to hear. <laughs> There's a lot of people who just blaze right ahead without really any consideration. And it's, it, it, it's interesting to me and it makes sense because of your background in, in, uh, in the stakeouts and celebrity photography. Yeah. That, that makes perfect sense when like, you I'm, I'm not into it like the, the whole jumping in front of people with the camera yeah uh how can you say all right i i had to put someone tell someone once i i was shooting we're on the street 
And think of it like this. Say you're a woman, you're on your phone, okay? And someone is either jumps in front of you with a camera or they stand over you and they're taking your picture, okay? Now take away the camera for five seconds. You've just got some person, big guy or whatever, staring at a woman, okay? It's very intimidating. So, you know, put that mindset. The next time you jump in front of someone, you're lucky you don't get punched. And if you get punched, you probably ask for it. Okay. Right. So I'm very, I'm very aware of that, but I, I, I can't knock it because I did it for 15 years with celebrity stuff or news. You know, we were always right. having a, my favorite clip of one of my favorite of my friend Shannon was, uh, I don't know if you ever saw the Bernie Madoff thing where Bernie pushes the guy and my friend Shannon just throws him backwards. He pushes Bernie. It's everything was very up close and personal. Huh. So you, you're close enough that they can push you and you can throw Bernie Madoff backwards. Um, I remember a friend of mine, Giles, he's like six foot eight, huge dude. Tommy Lee once got in an elevator with him, right? And um, he said something stupid to Giles and Giles is the wrong person. Giles just lays him out, knocks him out cold. So just wrong person to start on. Anyway, um, but that was the job back then. So I'm, I'm very aware of yeah. doing it with this. It's just something that I don't want to do anymore. I quit that business. Um, I that's think just you, me. You can see this. Or, or I, I think that I see this in your photographs, that there is an engagement. There appears to be an engagement with the subject that's not the the jump in front of them with a camera and click, click, click. I mean, there seems to be real engagement there. I can, I think that th these things come out in photographs when they're there. What you gotta remember is like, all right, this, it's not candid as well. If you jump in front of someone with a camera, it's anything but candid, right? right. It's kind of, it's shock and awe. It's like, you get that expression of like, oh, you know, well, yeah, of course you're gonna get that. Um, if that's if that's your style then great you know whatever um i like plenty of photographers like that you know i like their work it's just not my my style um you know probably one of my favorite photographers is gildan you know i love his stuff i just couldn't do it yeah nor could you i know. yeah it's i just don't i don't have the announced to do that but it's a certain kind of picture yeah. um you know martin parr same kind of thing i used to think but until i met him and he kind of explained his work i used to think that his was all that but a lot of his is set up mm. so i didn't i wasn't aware of that either um so you know every photographer's got their own style and that's that's the whole point right you all we all have our own creative voices otherwise we'd all just be bad clones of each other you know for me this is this is the work that i like doing you know engaging yeah. with people like you know this sunil you know he was made homeless during covid after um you know rest his restaurant went out of business and just found himself living under um the FDR drive. And I, I didn't even approach him. I was, I was down there doing a location scout for a commercial shoot. And he came up to me and just unloaded. Mm. Um, there's a lot of people that I, I chat with on the street for like sometimes an hour and a half, two hours. And I don't even take their picture. And I, I've never taken their picture. Do you sometimes, do you sometimes give these people the, the homeless folks that you meet or that you photograph do you give them like some money or a Starbucks card or something? Is, do you ever have any other type of transaction with them besides just the photograph or the conversation? Yeah, if they're, if they're so, a lot of it comes, it's got nothing to do with photography. It's moral compass, right? So each and, each and every person is going to be different and you can't tell them any otherwise. Yeah. Um, I, if someone's on the street and they have a cup out and you want to go and take their picture and you don't want to give them anything, 
That's on you. I, you know? I, I agree 110%. That's, that's, your, that's your thing. I, that's your thing. Um, do, you know, do you think in, I'm, ta- I'm thinking now of street and portraiture, but uh, portrait, street portraits in particular, it, do you get different reactions from people when it, when you're using an SL camera versus a range, the monochrome or a rangefinder camera, do you sense that there's any difference in the way people respond or the way the interactions occur? You know, I, the biggest time I noticed it was doing the celebrity shoots. Yeah. Okay. So every, I had this thing where I'd be doing all these old Nashville stars, Charlie Daniels, all these people, Donny Osmond, um, Paula Dean. Okay. So I was doing Paula Dean. And the way that it used to work would be I would be sent on my own with all my lighting. You know, you'd fly into Nashville, you'd set up, you'd have to do like five different portrait shots plus all the interior shots. So I'm doing Paula Dean. She sees one guy show up. You just think it's a joke, right? Like it's some big shoe and one guy shows up. And we're huddling around and I'm getting ready for my first shot and I'm shooting with like a, an M240 and I got like a the tethering mount at the bottom. And the, the makeup artist goes, is that a Leica? And I'm like, yeah. And, it's, and they just say, this guy ain't fucking around. This is the real <laughs> deal. And every shoot I would do, all these older people, they would always say, is that a Leica? And it was like this instant respect you got that, yeah, he's no joke. And then the Paula Dean one, they actually made me show all the images before they would let me leave the house. And she turned around and she was like, man, you do know what you're doing, don't you? So I was like, yep, I ain't messing around. That's funny. So That's funny. It, yeah, it, it's, it's got me out, it's got me uh, a lot of pictures. Um, and I end up sending a lot, most of the people I actually do shoots with um, end up using the pictures for themselves, so. It's, it's That's pretty good, but I haven't yeah. like as far as the SL versus the monochrome. It's it's always it's the name, right? Like even the other day, I was going into uh, the new uh, location, the summit. Okay, I've gone through all the security. I've got my camera around my neck, and one of the security guys comes to yank me, pull me over because no one had done my bag to check my bag, and he sees the camera and he goes, "That's a Leica." I'm like, yeah. And he said, oh, that's a nice camera, man. Like, oh, yeah, you know, you know, you, you get some nice pictures for that. And it's like this instant get them off your back. Like, you know, right. what you're, you know, it's not like, oh, yeah, it's not like some toy. Um, right. So it's been good. Um, you know, it's I find I I prefer to shoot with the rangefinders personally. Um, the SL, I really like for like the, the wet weather stuff, shooting in the snow. Yeah. I find it really good for that. But from just like a, a general feel, uh, just something I want to use. I, and that monochrome is just so ridiculously good. I know. Uh, I agree. I have an earlier generation monochrome that I adore. And I was with uh, shooting with a friend recently. And it's an M9 monochrome, so it's a few generations old. And I made it. That was a good one, though. Oh, I love it. I think that sensor is magic. And I made a couple of pictures. And she turned to me and said, does it always make that noise? And I was like, yeah, that's the shutter. That's what it is. But it's still, you know, it's still pretty quiet. And in fact, when the M9 came out, uh, or shortly after the M9 came out, the Fed said that um, in, in federal courtrooms, no camera can be louder than a Leica M9. That was their benchmark. <laughs> That's great. That was their benchmark, right? And so now these cameras that we're using are, you know, they're even even quieter and even more surreptitious. I'm I'm a I am a left-eyed shooter. And so I always have my face totally hidden behind the camera, okay. which is one of one of the reasons that some of the questions that I had for you this evening are I'm getting beaten to the punch by our by our attendees because they're asking a lot of these same questions. I have long said that I'm envious of right eyed shooters because they can continue to engage with their subjects. Right. Like you were talking about making the portraits where you get your, you frame everything up and you talk and 
click, yeah, click, yeah. click, 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 click. And because you have that engagement and that I always ask photographers, especially street, um, about that kind of engagement and, and being a right eyed shooter with the like a rangefinder can make a big, big difference. Uh, and, and for me, it certainly has. And that's one of the reasons I fell in love with the rangefinder. And one of the reasons that I, I realized at one point that on, on an SLR camera and even on the mirrorless camera, I think to a certain extent, your brain doesn't see the photographs that get taken because the mirror goes up, the screen goes dark and you've right. never actually seen that actual moment. And yeah. so for me, and I find this is true for many other street photographers. And I kind of wonder if it's true for you or you find it true for yourself as well, that having that engagement is part of what makes a good photograph. Yeah, you know, I, I think people's definitions of street is all very different as well. For me, it's just taking bloody pictures. Um, I like the engagement part of it. You know, I like the, I like the banter. You get, you some think really, I, I really enjoy that part of it. You get some playful stuff, some good images, but I like, I like talking. Some people are not comfortable talking to anybody. They like yeah. to be just, everything needs to be very stealth and you know that's their thing that's their their way of doing it um everyone has their own style you know and it, it's a good reason it's a good job that we have that you know? do you think that um do you think that a faith in humanity or liking people in general is an important element of street photography in a more in a general sense i think it's all our past experiences kind of come into one so what you did for a living, you know, what's your background? For me, I did jobs, all different walks of life from serving yeah. Prince Andrew silver service waitering to picking up cigarette butts in the rain, cleaning up street markets to garbage man, to DJ, to barman. You, you, you mingle with all different societies, all different kinds of people. And at the end of the day, we are all just people. So you've got to be able to get on with, get along with everybody. So I think that comes out in your work and uh, the sensibility you have to people when you're shooting as well. It comes out and that's, you can't, I don't think you can just train that. Like that's something you acquire from past experience or your life experience. I see it the same way. Yeah, I see it the same. Yeah. This book, this book, this street book is terrific. It's, it's terrific. If anybody who's on this Zoom who hasn't looked at these photographs or doesn't yet have a copy of the book, I don't. I got to buy one. Um, holy smokes. It's terrific. Right. I, I think Amazon is probably the only place that has any left now. Really? Uh, we, so it, it, I never knew. When I, I went, the only reason I ever found out anything about this book is because people were texting me saying, oh, I just saw it in this store, or I just saw it on Amazon, and I never was told anything. So I went on Amazon, and I looked up, and it had a number one next to it, and I was like, well, what the hell's that? So I looked it up, and it was the number one new release, and behind me was like Bill Cunningham and all these other people, and I was like, holy shit. Like, Top of the charts, Did my mom just go and buy the whole batch in one go? Like. I wasn't sure. And it's actually, um, it's, it's continued to do better. I think largely in part to like doing a lot of the talks during COVID. Yeah. You're getting out to a wider audience and like, it was still last time I checked, it was still in the top 50 bestsellers. And, um, so yeah, if you can get a copy, grab a copy, um, you know, and let me know what you think. Uh, I'd love to do another book at some point. I think uh, I just got to start building up the next body of work. And um, yeah, if you want to see any more of my work, go to philpemmon.com or um, at philpemmon on Instagram. And I'm also on uh, LinkedIn and Twitter and every other bloody social thing that's out there. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you that the, I've spent a lot of time on your website and, um, and, and looking at your photographs and on, on Instagram, there is something for everyone. It really is. It's a real treat to look at your, at your feed and to see 
and to see your pictures they they're they're uh, you know in one in one sense timeless and in another sense many of them are very much located in a time uh, you know as i hinted at before i think that there's in your photographs and in the street portraits in particular i get that this immediacy and this engagement and this humanness for lack of a better word that i i think is palpable in a lot of your photographs now we're we're about to run out of time, but do I, do I have time? Can we do a couple more questions? Am I good that way? Just a couple quick it. questions. Do you, how much do you zone for? Dollar a minute. <laughs> As, under a minute? Dollar a minute. A dollar a minute. <laughs> Man, I, maybe I should raise my rates. Yeah. Do you, how much do you zone focus? Like, do you, are you? I, Just I, with I the candid you, stuff. Oh, the, yeah. the thing is with the, the way that I shoot is and most of the stuff that I shoot is all wide open. Yeah. So okay. I, I, I like to have, I like a lot of depth in my work. So I'm, I'm always shooting 1.4 or on the 75, 1.25. Yeah. So yeah. like, so when I'm trying to shoot people on the street, it's more a case of focusing up on a spot on the road. Yeah. And yeah, that's a great them, idea. And, and when you come into that, like knowing yeah. that there's going to be a short burst once they hit that part of the pavement. Um, I do zone stuff where, I, you know, if say you're shooting on a 28 and you put it at like five, six F8 and then just put it at six feet, whatever. Um, yeah, I, I do that for the candid stuff, but I like the look of that 1.4. Yeah, me too. It's when, a little bit harder, but it's I, I think it's worth it. I agree. I agree. I think it also I think that it also kind of trains you to get really in tune with the gear and where the focal plane is and where and, and what it's going to do. Yeah. How much time do you spend when you when you go out on a typical day street shooting? How much time do you spend taking photographs? And how many how many images would you say you make in a day like a uh, day of street shooting? Oh, depends. Um, if it's a snow day, it's ridiculous. So you really I'm, like the snow. I you know what it is? It's I don't like people. <laughs> So I just go out there when it's snowing. I would never get. I would never guess hearing you talk. Yeah. Um, no, it just it could be. So like on a snow day, if I go out, of, say four a.m., get home. I'll I'll usually come home when it's not like the heavy stuff. When the heavy stuff stops, and you'll get home and you'll be like, oh my god, I'm so wiped out. I don't know why. And then you look at like your your watch or your phone and say, I oh, got I just did seventeen miles walking and. I've got 4,000 images to go through, you know? Wow. Um, well, like this morning, you know, I went out for say four or five hours and I'll come back with like, I don't know, four, four or 500 frames, but it might be um, subtle changes on a composition of a, a similar image. Right. So I'm, I'm working on one frame, but I'm just tweaking it different ways, yeah. like yeah. trying different angles. Um, how do you how do you structure your your uh, street photography workshops? If uh, for anybody who uh, anybody who hasn't taken a Leica Academy or street photography or a photography workshop, I highly recommend them. There's something for everyone, and word has it that Phil's workshops are outstanding. I can tell you that they sell out almost immediately. I'm gonna try to get in on one. But we have a question about what's your what's your structure like? Can you give us a brief description of of what your photo uh, street photography workshops are, how they're structured, and what they're like? Long days, yeah. So it's a lot of shooting. So we'll go. Um, all right. So no, normally, like uh, we'll have a Friday evening presentation. Like I'll go through some work, how I want you to look at things. Um, it's not like here are my greatest hits. Here is the stuff that didn't make the cut. And this is the one that made it and how we got there. So we'll spend like a two, three hour talk together. Then generally we'll get up for early sunrise. So six, sometimes earlier. Um, and then we'll go out shoot for probably about four or five hours. Then we go in the edit room. I'll walk you through my editing, how I cull. We do that for a few hours and then we go out shooting again in the evening. And then it all happens again the next day. I so we, we shoot a lot. Um, I've got two coming up in London. Uh, unfortunately, both sold out. And then I've come back to New York. That's sold out. We're doing one in DC in August. 
And then I believe I'm going to be doing another one in uh, probably in New York, I believe maybe October. And then I'm probably going to be doing one in Rome in October as well. Wow. And, then and then there's talk of doing one in Paris as well. Well, I'd love to get you here in the Midwest somewhere, you know, whether it's no matter yeah. what city it is, I'm certainly happy to travel to do a workshop with you. Now, you mentioned editing. You Do you edit your own photographs or do you have a friendly photo editor that you work with or do you, is, is the curating and editing is something that you do all yourself? I So I'll work with different curators. I, I think it's very important that you have an outside eye. So I you have an emotion, you, everyone has an emotional attachment to an image and then a curator comes along and says, it's shit. Get <laughs> over it. Move on. Next. Um, so now I'll work with different curators because it's just good to have an outside eye, especially if you're doing a show or you're doing a book. Like um, editing wise, I'll do all my own editing. Um, it's all again, it's all very minimal when it comes to the commercial stuff. I have an outside editor that I work with okay. called, Ken, who, called Ken Harris, who's one of the best in the business. Just it's, it's one of these you, you start talking and you're lost at hello. It's just like <laughs> you lost me, man. Um, they know he has every version of Photoshop and he still uses every version because one tool with one is better than the other. Um, and, you know, these you can't be good at everything, right? So you've yeah. got to you've got to you've got to hire the best people to get the best job. So I'll use them for my co commercial work, but for everything else, and then printing. You know, I, I work with different labs as well around the world to do the shows. I think you got to hire the people that are good at what they do. Yeah, I agree. I agree, and I I would like to echo that sentiment. I think that having a curator. Is, is absolutely essential, whether that curator is your a friend or a partner or a professional relationship or whatever, more professional relationship, whatever it is. And because I have, I've said to people, I'm like, wow, ah, man, I made this great picture. And they're like, meh. And then there's other <laughs> things where I'm like, where I'm like, you like that one? Really? I don't yeah. think that's very good. I think it's really important. And it doesn't mean necessarily that the curator or whoever this actor is that get, that's giving you feedback or input is necessarily right and necessarily should be taken all of their advice but it is really good i find to have that outside eye it's in fact it's essential um and it's it's also i think that humbling even for a pro like yourself it's it it, it is a little bit humbling and it kind of for me anyway it resets the clock it's like oh what was it that they keyed into was it the you know, the shape, was it the light? What, what was it that they keyed into that I either didn't realize was in the image or didn't give credit for being as good, as good as oh, it is. You don't, the, the thing is like, you, you can't buy into your own hype, right? All of us can be better all the time. Like I'm always trying to be better. Like you, you know where you're, where you're at and how much better you can be like by ex exploring trying different things all the time. The, the moment you kind of think you're it, you, you're already over, in my opinion. Um, so it's very important to take their advice on board. Um, again, you, you don't have to listen to everything. The, the ones that I find very telling, like anyone that follows me on Instagram, they'll know, they'll know that I put up these, I'll put up a set of images and I always ask, which one resonates with you? Because it's, or it will be, which one do you prefer? Like, I already know which one I prefer, but the, the feedback that you get is just invaluable as a photographer because the stuff that you'll pick up on, you didn't even think of. And someone's seen something, or I, I did this whole thing on my website where it was like the latest stuff that I did. And it basically, the premise was everything that wasn't fit for Instagram. You know, I find... Um, social media can be very dangerous with photography. Like people start chasing likes and are like, oh, we see that abstract minimal street photography is hot. So everyone starts shooting like that and you, you start killing people's creativity. So I came up with this thing or everything that wasn't fit for Instagram. And it was basically my vision, the, the work that I like to show and the stuff that I want to shoot that doesn't necessarily chase the likes. The stuff that the prints that people were buying were not the ones that I would think would be the ones that would sell. Mm. 
you know, it was like a picture of a G-Wagon with someone that was homeless in the distance. And someone's thinking, oh, that's the discrepancy between rich and poor. And that's what they're seeing. And then the next one might be a picture of a bar where it says just one more pint. Or another one might be a street that they just happen to live on, you know, 10 years ago. So again, it was like, these are all things that you can take on board, like feedback. So whenever I go out and shoot now, I'm thinking differently. I'm like, you know, I need to capture all these things because these are things that are going to be possible sellers or they're interesting to somebody. Hmm. It's all good feedback. Yeah. I like that a lot. And I have noticed that on your Instagram that you, that you ask for that feedback almost all the time. Yeah. I think that's terrific. I like that a lot. You know, like you can get, you, you go through it and you start reading all the comments. Like I, I reply to every single comment, first of all. So if you message me, I will message you back. I, I don't believe in ghosting drives me insane. Um, so if you message me, you have questions about something, I will reply to you. Um, but it's interesting because everybody else reads all the feedback as well. And then they start getting involved and picking up on other people's feedback or agreeing. And then it becomes like this huge group discussion. The only problem is sometimes I put out the odd thing and because I reply to everything, uh, I think once I had 400 comments and then you're now replying to 400 comments, which takes a shitload of time. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, I think again. it's terrific that you engage like that. I think it's awesome. I think it's really, it's terrific. And I wish that we had lots more time to talk, but we're, we're kind of out of time, but I, I would like to been a encourage, pleasure. what's that? Been a pleasure. Thanks it so has much. been a pleasure. It has been a pleasure. I, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us and, and share your photographs. I think they're terrific. And I hope that the other folks that are here on our little Zoom Artist talk uh, enjoyed it as as much as I did, um, and I always learn something new. I love I love to learn, and I love talking to new people and 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 seeing new faces. And I'm just overjoyed at how many of y'all showed up. Uh, I would like to remind everyone that you are most welcome to contact myself um, or Phil on his Instagram. He answers comments um, and uh, um, ask. Ask questions. Let me know if there's something that you wanted to ask but didn't have it formulated in time or something that you become curious about. Um, uh, I can tell you that at what, what I do at Tamarkin Camera, a lot of it is information based. It's not all sales based. So please don't be, don't be shy or afraid to reach out with a question. Not everything has to do with, with buying and selling Leica cameras. Um, Phil, I'm just overjoyed to talk to you, man. This has really been a lot of fun. Um, and I hope that uh, I hope that y'all had a, a good time too, and that uh, you'll continue getting out there taking photographs and that uh, maybe there's something that you heard or saw here that inspired you in some way or got you thinking, uh, or at least sent you over to Amazon to buy a copy of this, uh, this book if there's any left. Awesome. So thank you once again, Phil and John and everybody that's been on this call. It's really been terrific. Uh, uh, we hope to, uh, to talk to you real soon and there will be a recording. And so if you'd like to get in touch with that recording, please do send me an email and I'll make sure that everybody, uh, uh, it gets the, the recording and you can view this at your leisure, um, and learn, learn more at your, at your own leisure from this talk. So once again, thank you all so much for joining. Have a lovely evening, John and Phil. Thank you so much for this. Stay well, everyone. Thanks everybody. Thanks.